Some of you may know that uh, we've had a bit of a troubling and difficult week. Um, as a result, I've not been able to do the, the amount of study that I would normally do for a talk. I was planning to start a new series called The 37 Things That Accompany Salvation. Um, but it's a big topic which requires a lot of study and I only had that amount of time. So I've parked that, we'll pick it up another time and uh, I've decided just to preach to the converted this morning. So it's going to be very easy this morning. Um, and, uh, but I hope that it blesses you. Let's bow our heads in prayer and commit the teaching of God's word into our Father's hands. Father God, we turn to you this morning and once more. And we thank you for your grace towards us, that you show us your favour when we deserve none. We thank you that you love us, that you embrace us, and then, Lord, you seek to make us more into your image, that we might relate more to you and we might enjoy you more. We pray, Father God, that you would come and anoint me with your Holy Spirit as I come to share this morning, that the words that I share would be spirit and life, and would be a blessing to us all. And that, Lord, we would go away having been built up and encouraged in our spirits with a new vigour and enthusiasm and desire to share our faith with others in the week that lies ahead. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I became a Christian age 16. 16, almost 17, in 1991. That means I'm going to be 50 in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and when I uh, became a Christian, I could not tell you what the gospel was. I could not tell you what sin was. And I could not tell you why Jesus died upon the cross. All I knew was that Jesus was real, that I needed to live for him, and that if I didn't, I would go to hell. That was my only understanding that Jesus was real, that I needed to live for him, and if I didn't, I would go to hell. And it was on that that I came to faith. Now, it was about a year later, uh, I received a revelation from God concerning the gospel, that I first understood what the gospel was. And I remember it very clearly. I'd been over my friend Jane's house, along with a group of my friends. We'd been praying that evening. And on the way home, walking in the dark, I remember walking, and I can still see in my mind's eye the place on the pavement in Maskell's Park by a brick wall where suddenly an understanding fell into my mind of what the gospel is. Suddenly at that moment I understood, and I can't tell you how, that sin is disobedience to God, and Jesus died to take the punishment for that sin, for that disobedience. I remember it clear as day. Now since then, I've listened to teaching tapes, as was, MP3s and podcasts, as are now. I've watched videos, gone over to DVDs, and now have watched YouTube. And uh, I've attended church and listened to pastors and teachers teach. But most of all, I have studied the Bible, I've prayed, and I've grown in my understanding and my faith. And there are lots of the books of the Bible I've, I, I haven't studied yet. I'm desperate to. I'm desperate to get into the book of Deuteronomy, for example. And there are lots of themes and subjects I've yet to explore. And I'm excited to look into those things. But yet the core doctrine of Christianity, the fundamental truth, central truth to the faith, remains and ever will be the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the core doctrine. And the gospel message thrills me above all other messages, above all other topics and themes. And I'm always seeking to understand the gospel more clearly. I'm always trying to find new facets and angles on it, to gain a deeper revelation on its meaning. And I think that should be the lifebeat in all of our spirits. The one thing that we should never tire of hearing, that we should always be hungry to hear and know more about, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you ever get tired of hearing the gospel, there is something inside of you that's not right. And I suspect that what I share with you this morning is not new to anybody. 
It's not unfamiliar. In fact, it's quite old. And this is by no means a landmark message, but I hope that it blesses you and whets your appetite to know more of the gospel and to share more of the gospel. So I've got a lot of scriptures. Uh, I'm in two minds as to whether to flick through the Bible and find them. I suppose we could have a race to see who gets there quicker. But let's start. There's a condition that affects all men, and it is called sin. And sin is described in the Bible as breaking or violating the law of God. 1 John 3 verse 4. Beat you, I'm there already. And in 1 John 3 verse 4 it says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness or transgression or breaking of the law. God has declared in his word how we are to conduct our lives. Sin is the failure to observe those standards of conduct. Sin is the failure to obey the laws in God's word. Sin is to break those commands. Now already some of you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, aren't we saved by grace? Surely we don't have to obey all those Old Testament laws. Well, you may be right. There are 613 commands in the Old Testament Mosaic law. Do you know how many commands are in the New Testament? 1,050. If you don't believe me, I've got a list of them at home. How many of those have you kept? How many of those have you broken? James 2, verse 10. James 2, verse 10. And it says this. For whoever keeps, so for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. What James is saying is if you've just broken just one of these laws in the Bible, you're guilty of breaking all the laws. That's how it stands before God. And the Bible declares that there are two types of people. One is the righteous and the other is the wicked. The righteous is the one who keeps all of God's decrees. The wicked is the one who sins and breaks God's decrees. So decide now in your mind, am I in the camp of the righteous or am I in the camp of the wicked? Let me turn to Ezekiel 18 just to prove that to you. There you go, it gets harder when you go to the Old Testament, doesn't it? Ezekiel 18. And in Ezekiel 18, I'm going to read from verse 20 to verse 24. Starting halfway down, verse 20. Ezekiel 18. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which is committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? But... When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is, he, of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them he shall die. There, clearly we see those two camps, the righteous and the wicked. The righteous are the one who obeys God's statutes, laws and commands. The wicked is the one who disobeys them and sins. And if you have broken any of God's commands, you are guilty of breaking all of his commands. So if you break God's commands, God counts you among the wicked. The Bible calls you wicked. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. This is in the Song of Moses, and in verse 4, he says, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright. This is the character of God. Our, the Lord God is a God of justice, 
and he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. The wicked, i.e. the one who sins, must be judged, and the righteous, i.e. the one who is free of sin, will be delivered. Let me prove that to you in Proverbs 11. In Proverbs 11 and verse 21 we read this. Though they join forces, the wicked will not go unpunished, but the posterity of the righteous will be delivered, or the seed of the righteous will be delivered. So we see that our God is a God of justice, and he must judge the wicked, and the wicked will not go unpunished, but the seed of the righteous will be delivered. So we can see that we've all broken God's commands, and we all stand guilty before a holy God, we all stand guilty before a God of justice who must punish sin. And if you sin against an eternal God, you deserve an eternal punishment. Now you might think, well, that's not fair. It's only one sin. By your fallen system of justice, maybe that's not fair. But by God's perfect system of justice, that is fair. By God's perfect system of justice, if you have sinned against an eternal God, you deserve an eternal punishment. Let me leave you hanging there on that thought for a moment. Where did sin come from? Well, the origin of sin is the first man, Adam. In Romans 5, in Romans 5 verse 12, we read this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Adam contracted the virus. Then he passed it down to the entire human race so that all men and all women are born infected. Sin is congenital. It is hereditary. It is a sickness for which there is no vaccine, no antibiotics, for which there is no radi radiotherapy or chemotherapy. We all carry it in our veins. And while we're in Romans, we can flick back to Romans 3, uh, verse 3, verse 23, where it says, we all know this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many people are included in that term all? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all get fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. The truth declared by scripture is no one is innocent of sin. Nobody is free of sin. All people of all ages fail to meet God's standards of righteousness presented to us in his commands. We all stand guilty before a holy God. And what is the consequence of sin? What is the consequence of sin? Romans 6 verse 23 turn over your page Romans 6 verse 23 for the wages of sin is death but hallelujah the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord for the wages of sin is death in Ezekiel 18 20 Ezekiel says the soul who sins shall die the consequence and punishment for sin is death now how many deaths are there in the Bible how many deaths are in the Bible? The Bible talks about three deaths. In your own head, can you name those three deaths? They are a spiritual death, a physical death, and the second death. The spiritual death, physical death, and second death. And this is the consequence of sin. This is the punishment of sin. Now, to understand these three deaths, we need to understand man. Man is made up of three parts. Anybody want to tell me what those three parts are? Spirit, soul, body. Absolutely. Spirit, soul, body. And spiritual death affects the spirit. Physical death affects the body. And the second death affects the soul. I'll try to explain to you what I mean. Let's just look at the body for a minute. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Different translations word this differently. Some make it clearer, some make it less clear. In Genesis 2 verse 7, 2 verse 7 we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, 
and he breathed it into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being or a living soul. So what we have here is God formed the man of the dust of the ground. That's his body. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is God giving him a spirit, and he became a living soul. He has a soul, the entity of his being. That is man, body, soul, and spirit, three parts. Now let's look at spiritual death. The spirit is the part of man that communicates with God. And it was that part of man that communicates with God that died in the Garden of Eden. Spiritual death happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam rebelled against God. You're still in Genesis, I hope. Genesis 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. For Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree in disobedience to God's command, which we know is a sin, and the result is death, spiritual death. In Genesis 3, verse 7, we read, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. There was a discernible change when they sinned, There was two effects. The first effect was that they became self-aware. They knew that they were naked. They didn't know that before. They became self-aware. And that is what sin does. It makes you look inwardly. It makes you selfish. It makes you think about yourself. And the second thing that happened, the second effect, was their communion and relationship with God was broken. The spiritual union with God was lost because the spirit died inside. How do I know that their union and communion with God was broken? Read verse 8, the very next verse. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Do you hide from somebody if you've got a good working relationship with them? No, you don't. They hid from God because their communion was broken because they knew something had changed. This is spiritual death. It was experienced by the spirit of Adam and it passed down to us through the generational line so that we all are born naturally with a broken communion to God. That's spiritual death. Okay then, physical death. The body is the part of the man that communicates to the world through the senses, through uh, what we say, through what we feel, through what we touch, what we taste. And as spiritual death breaks the union with God, so physical death breaks the union with the world. The soul leaves the body and enters eternity, while the body returns to the dust of the ground. Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body, Spiritual death is a separation of the soul from God. Adam didn't only experience spiritual death in the garden, he also experienced physical death, didn't he? Turn over your page to Genesis 5, verse 5. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. That's his physical death. Spiritual death, physical death. Now, the soul is the part of man, the essence of a person. We're now moving on to second death. We've done spiritual death, we've done physical death, now we're talking about second death. The soul is the part of man, the essence of a person. It is what makes them human. It makes them a living being. It is the eternal aspect of their being. And the Bible speaks of two destinies for the soul. Two destinies, two possible destinies for the soul. The first, For the soul of the righteous, whose name will be in the book of life, they shall experience resurrection and eternal life under a new heaven on a new earth. That's the destiny for the soul of the righteous. But for the soul of the wicked, we're told, whose names will not be in the book of life, they shall be delivered to judgment and be cast into the lake of fire. That's the destiny for the soul of the wicked. And we've already defined the wicked earlier on as those who sin against God. Let's turn to the other end of the book, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, uh, verse 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. 
this is the second death. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you are wicked, if you have sinned, if you've broken God's commandments, you're counted as the wicked, your name is not in the book of life and you will be cast into the lake of fire. That is the second death. The second death affects the soul. It is the eternal punishment of the soul. And in whatever condition a person's soul is, when they die physically, will determine whether they experience the second death or not. There is no second chance after you die. So we have a just God who must punish sin, a race of sinful people who deserve judgment. All are born once, inheriting a condition of spiritual death from Adam. All will die once, experiencing a physical death, but will all die twice and face the second death? That's the question I put before you this morning. Will all die twice and face the second death? Well, Scripture tells us that God entered into the world in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God incarnate, the incarnation. I hope to talk about that at Christmas. God added humanity to his divinity so that Jesus become, was not only totally God, but totally man. We can read about that in Philippians chapter 2. Harder to find Philippians, it's somewhere in the letters. God's Electric Power Company. Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8. Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8. Who being in the form of God, talking about Jesus Christ Jesus, who being in form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was not robbing, taking anything by God from God by saying he was equal with God. He was declaring the truth. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. Even though he was God, he came in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even further and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. See, God not only became a man in Jesus, he experienced physical death like every man will experience. All four Gospels give us an account of his death. I won't go to all four Gospels, I'll just go to Matthew and chapter 27. And in Matthew 27, we have an account of Jesus' physical death. I'll just read verse 50, that's all we really need. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded it up his spirit. He died there upon the cross of Golgotha almost 2,000 years ago. Jesus died a physical death on the cross and the centurion, if you remember, pierced his side to prove he was dead and he was buried in a rich man's tomb as further evidence that he had in fact died. But this was more than just a physical death. This was a sacrificial death. He was dying on behalf of sinful humanity. He was dying on behalf of sinful humanity. There's tons of verses we could go to about this. I'm going to go to 1 John chapter 3. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, we read this. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Jesus substituted himself for every sinful man who has and who ever will live. He substituted himself for everyone, all mankind. And if all are counted wicked due to being born with sin, and if the just punishment for sin is death, then Jesus' death served to take the punishment from the wicked, and he paid for us. Every man, if you like, is born on death row, and Jesus takes their place on death row so that those on death row can go free. Hebrew, Hebrews 2 verse 9 says that Jesus tasted death for everyone. 
for everyone. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 to 6, it says, The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. He, Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. You know, the wicked, sinful man is born into slavery to sin. He's held captive by sin, kidnapped by sin, if you like. And Jesus' death was the price, was the ransom to buy every man from that slavery, to deliver them from the kidnapper. This is freedom or redemption in Jesus. That's why he died upon the cross. Jesus died that man need not die. He rose from the dead on the third day, as testified by all four Gospels. I'll go back to Matthew. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, dead. Uh, uh, Matthew 28, I'm going to go to. And in Matthew 28, I'm going to read verses 5 to 6. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. He is not here, for he is risen. And in rising from the dead, Jesus proved himself greater than death. Every man and woman dies. It is the ultimate statistic. One out of one people die. Nobody has risen from the dead to never die again. Jesus is unique. And by so doing, he proved himself greater than death. Peter, in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Acts 2 verse 24 says this, Whom God raised up, speaking of Jesus, who God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. It was not possible he should be held by it. Death could not hold Jesus. Jesus was stronger than death. It was impossible for death to hold Jesus Christ in its clutches. Jesus defeated death. And Christ's resurrection is a victory over death. Not only is Christ's resurrection a victory over death, it's a victory in the way that defeats spiritual death it defeats physical death and it defeats the second death. Those three deaths are defeated in Jesus' resurrection. If a person believes in and puts their faith in Jesus' death, burial and resurrection as the just punishment for their sin, then they are set free from sin and they're set free from death. I'm going to say that again. If a person believes in and puts their confidence in Jesus' death, burial and resurrection as the just punishment for their sin, then they are set free from their sin and they're set free from death. Romans 10 verse 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Man may confess with his mouth, and only God can see if there's faith in the heart. But can you see that you need to do two things? You need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. It's not just sufficient that you believe inside. The devils believe and tremble. You must confess with your mouth. There must be an outward expression of your faith. Somebody might say they're a Christian, but does their faith, their life, reflect what they're saying with their mouth? Uh, a man may be able to put the, pull the wool over the eyes of another man by what he says, but a man cannot pull the wool over the eyes of God who sees the heart. Provision has been made at the cross to set man free from death, but that provision has to be applied to your life by faith. Every person is born into death row, as I said. Jesus takes their place on death row so that, that those on death row can go free but if you do not believe in Jesus, you remain on death row, heading towards physical death and second death. Every person is born into slavery to sin, and Jesus' death was the price. It was the ransom, as I said, to buy every man from that slavery. And there is freedom and redemption in Jesus. But if you do not believe in Jesus, you remain in chains. 
You remain in slavery with a destiny towards physical death and a second death. John chapter 3, please. John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again. The process of believing in Jesus is the process of being born again. Jump down to verses 5 and 6. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus is describing two births here. Being born of water and being born of the spirit. Being born of the water is natural birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Being born of the spirit is spiritual birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. All people experience natural birth. Being born of water, a mother's water breaks and the child is born. Isn't that true? But only people who put their faith and trust in Jesus experience spiritual birth, being born of the Spirit. Spiritual birth counters the effect of spiritual death. Spiritual birth counters the effect of spiritual death. The spirit of a man which died in Adam which broke the union between the Spirit and God, is awoken again through spiritual birth. You're made alive again in Jesus. Your spirit is awoken and suddenly there is communion. There is union between you and God again because of spiritual birth. You are made alive. You know, you do, your spirit died in the first Adam, but your spirit is made alive in the last Adam. The last Adam is a title of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 says, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Jesus, the last Adam, gives life to the spirit. This is why an unbeliever can look upon the believer as irrational. Because the unbeliever speaks from a place of intellect and emotion. But the believer speaks beyond intellect and emotion. The believer speaks from a place of experience. To which the unbeliever cannot relate. Because their spirit remains dead. They cannot know, they cannot understand, they cannot relate to what it's like to have your spirit awoken and have communion with God. Because their spirit is still dead. If a person dies with a dead spirit, they experience physical death and in a state of spiritual death, they will face the second death, the lake of fire. But if a person dies with a living spirit, they might yet still experience physical death, but in a state of spiritual life, therefore they will not face the second death. They will enjoy eternal life. In fact, eternal life begins the moment you believe and are born again. If you are born again, you are living in eternal life right now. So, if you have two births, you'll experience one death. If you have one birth, you'll experience two deaths. All men are born spiritually dead in their spirit sin. But if you have two births, physical birth and spiritual birth, you'll experience one death, physical death. But if you have one birth, you're just physically born, you're not spiritually born, you'll experience two deaths, the physical death and the second death. 1 Thessalonians 5, please. 1 Thessalonians 5. It's in here somewhere. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 and 10. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Whether we wake or sleep, we should be with him. I like that word, sleep. For the Christian, for the one who is born again, for the one who has experienced second birth, for the one who has had their spirit awoken, for the one who believes and trusts in Jesus Christ, the Bible describes their death as sleep. They're laid to rest in the certain and sure hope that they will awake again in the presence of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, we read, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If we experience physical death and our soul is separated from our body, we will be in the presence of the Lord. Even physical death is defeated in Jesus' resurrection because we don't really die, we just go to sleep. Hallelujah. However, for the unbeliever, for the one who is only born once, for the one who has not experienced the second birth, for the one who remains in a state of spiritual death, for the one who does not believe and trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible describes their death as leading not to the presence of God, but leading to judgment. Can you turn to Hebrews 9, please? Get past Paul when you get to Hebrews, which may or may not be Paul. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. I think we all know this. Hebrews 9 verse 27. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. This is the default destiny for all men born. To die once, and then comes the judgment. That judgment being the second death. But Jesus offered to bear the sins of everyone. And if you trust in him and his sacrifice, if you eagerly wait for him, you will experience salvation. Let's read verses 27 and 28. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. That's the standard pattern. So Christ, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who will eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Will of Christ appear to you for judgment or will he appear to you for salvation? Will you experience three deaths or will you be saved from all deaths? Jesus' death defeated spiritual death, defeated physical death and he defeated the second death. Your spirit can be alive instead of dead. You can go to sleep instead of physically dying. You can be with the Lord Jesus on a new earth under a new heaven or you can experience a second death in the lake of fire. The choice, dear friend, is yours. John 3, uh, 17, my penultimate verse. You'll be pleased to hear. John 3, verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, God does not want to condemn you. He doesn't wish to condemn you. He wishes to save you. His hand is outstretched toward you. Reach out in faith and take that hand. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O taste and see that the Lord is good. To taste something means you've got to take it and you've got to have the faith to put it in your mouth, trusting that it will do you good and no harm. So my exhortation is, take Jesus, take Jesus. Let him fill your heart. Let him do you good. Let him wash away the pain and the sorrow. And let him bring you new life. Amen. Father God, I pray that you'd give us an appetite to want to know the gospel on a deeper, richer level. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to never tire of hearing the gospel being spoken of and shared and preached. And I pray, Lord, that you'd place within us a deeper understanding with a greater familiar with key scriptures so that, Lord, when we are given opportunity, we might be able to share with others and offer them the gift of salvation that we ourselves have received ourselves. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. 
We know what it is to have our spirit awoken. Lord, help us to be able to share that gift with others, that others too might know and experience the same. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.